everyone. Happy, I've been told, it's Argentina. This is Dr. Jane Zalatova. She is an ecosystem ecologist. She's currently a research scientist at the University of Wyoming, which is also on leave because she's a junior triple S fellow in Washington, D.C. Um, she's based in the Department of Energy right now. She's working on clean coal solutions. Um, one of her projects is actually near coastal Montana, so helping these communities, um, you know, go towards the future. Let's see. She has her bachelor's from the University of Georgia. She received her PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder, which is where we met in graduate school. She's on a postdoc at the USGS and MOAB, and um, now a fellow at the AAAS. And she's also one of the founders of 500 Women Scientists, which she will talk about today. So that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to let her do the rest. So please welcome Jane. Okay. Hey. Um, Awesome to be here. Um, I could have loved Montana more. This is my fourth trip to Montana this year. No, it was over the last year. This is my first trip to this calendar year. But I've been to Montana a lot. Um, I've been here a lot for work. I've been here to get a job. I really like it. Um, do I like it more than Wyoming? I don't know. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today isn't just my science work, but I'm also going to talk to you about how I envision scientists being involved in um, making the world a better place, how we can use science and figure out ways to have a career in science that doesn't necessarily match what maybe your advisors here at Montana uh, State University are doing. So um, maybe I'll give you some ideas about what you can do with a degree in science. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my passion for science communication and making films about science and taking the scientists out of their lab coats and out of the labs and into the real world where other people actually can meet them and fall in love with science just like we have. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about 500 Women Scientists, which is a, a grassroots organization that we, without at all meaning to, with zero intention, have started and has like blown up and taken over a lot of the internet. So um, sometimes activism just kind of comes and grabs you whether you like it or not and becomes the thing that you do with all of your free time. <laughs> so that is what I do. So uh, like John said, I am a research scientist at the University of Wyoming, uh, but I'm currently on leave, or rather I'm on loan to the Department of Energy. And I'll talk uh, a little bit about what I do there, but mostly I'm going to talk about how I see science fitting into how we govern and how we make decisions um, about our world. So um, today's talk, there will be very few data slides, and the only slides I'm going to show you with data will have nothing to do with science, but will have to do with activism. So um, I thought it'd be kind of interesting for the grad students in the room if I shared my path in science. I always feel like when I was in grad school, I just looked up with these big eyes at people who are PhDs and professors, and I was like, how do I become like you? How do I do the things that you do? Um, and I never, like, they never really said how they got to where they were. Um, and sometimes the paths are really meandering and weird. And so I thought, like, for the grad students here, I could share how I got to where I am today, which was somewhat traditional to begin at the start, but very untraditional at the end, which is where I am now. So I got a PhD in ecology. I studied ants. Um, I was really interested in ants because I did this weird undergrad project in Costa Rica where I took these Azteca ants that were living in these Cecropia trees and I shook the trees and the ants came out and I took a tree and I leaned it against another tree and basically watched World War III take place when the ants were fighting and their body parts coming out and like it was crazy and I was like, oh, I did, this is really fun. If I was going to do science, why don't I just watch ants do crazy things? stuff and then that will be science and I'll, I can get a degree in that. So um, I chose grad school kind of based on location and access to the outdoors um, and less based on access to like the right advisor or the right science atmosphere and I just happened to get really lucky but looking back on it um, my three criteria were skiing, climbing, and a really good ultimate frisbee team. <laughs> and those things coincided in Boulder, Colorado. So that is where I went, um, having never been to Colorado really before at all. So um, I got to grad school, and I my advisor didn't have any money for me. There were no big grants in our lab. We were kind of this 
Um, weird lab of like people studying different social insects, and there were no big money in studying ants fighting each other and body parts falling down. So I wrote a lot of really small, tiny grants. So $500, $250. If I got $1,000, I was like, yes, I have money for the whole summer. I'm going to do research all summer long. So I wrote a lot of grants, and I taught every semester, including every summer. I taught the summer um, general biology class, which was as fun for the students as it was for me. So I tried to make it as fun as possible um, for the six weeks that I was teaching, and then I would bank that money for the rest of the summer and then go do research. So um, it, I think it was actually, looking back on it, a fine, a fine way to do it, um, and only $30,000 in debt. Because like how much we got paid at Sea Boulder wasn't really enough to live in Boulder, Colorado, so I had to uh, borrow money. But um, either way, I feel like I had this amazing six years where I just got to do really fun science and learn. And I learned mostly from the other students um, that were in graduate school with me. I learned much more from them than I did from any professor that I interacted with or anyone else. And it's really the interactions with the other grad students that changed the path of my science from studying ants um, and ant community ecology to really thinking more about climate change and biogeochemistry. So in my last couple of years of grad school, I started playing around with soil and realized I really liked soil. Um, it wasn't a cool ant that was doing stuff, but it was really important, and I really liked digging holes <coughs> and being outside. So it worked out for me. Um, and I started kind of changing direction. So my last chapter of my PhD was all about ants and soil because of the other students that I met in grad school. And I was able to publish all of my chapters as papers. That's something that you're supposed to do in grad school, and somehow, miraculously, I did it. It was mostly because I was trying to protect myself from my committee, who were going to be hostile at my defense, because I changed my PhD so much from ants to soil, that I just wanted to go ahead and get everything published so that if I had, they had any kind of feedback, I was like, that's constructive and interesting, but I already published this, so <laughs> noted. Um, so I left C of Boulder and got a postdoc in ecosystem science. Um, the USGS decided to give me a chance, even though I didn't have a lot of ecosystem science experience. And I went and moved to Moab, Utah, where I worked on a big climate change experiment. And it was really awesome. And it got me really excited about climate change experiments in general. So I feel like. Um, you know, the way that we approach science and ecology sometimes is we make a lot of observations and then we try to infer something about a process on, based on an observation that we make. Um, but I was really excited about actually testing hypotheses and doing experiments to test very specific things. And the USGS at the time and some other institutions got money from the Department of Energy and NSF to build a set of different kinds of climate change experiments across the US. They were all sort of manipulating similar factors like warming, um, and some of them were also doing rainfall manipulations to really try to understand how climate change is going to impact these different ecosystems across the US, and that giving us a chance to be able to compare across different places. <clears throat> so um, as a postdoc, I ran these experiments. I first worked on one in um, Moab, and then I moved to University of Wyoming, where they also had a climate change experiment. So I worked on the one in Wyoming as well. And um, I wrote a lot of grants, I wrote a lot of papers, um, I wrote more grants and more papers, and it was really uh, kind of, it felt like kind of like a second PhD because I was doing it in a topic I didn't really study before, ecosystem science. I had to learn about carbon cycling, nitrogen cycling, phosphorus. I remember calling Jod at some point and trying to get her to explain to me what nitrogen isotopes mean because I inherited this nitrogen isotope data set and I didn't understand how to interpret it, and it was really weird. So um, it was a lot of learning and it was really fun, but I do feel like I got two PhDs for the price of two, I guess. Um, there was no discount for the second one, it was just more work. But I got to live in a beautiful place, and again, I got to work with amazing USGS scientists, and I learned so much. And so um, both my PhD and my postdocs there were more than one, uh, kind of got me to think about the world in this weird conceptual way. And so um, I always make my students make conceptual diagrams, and um, I, I think it's useful. And so this is my conceptual diagram of how I think about um, ecology. And so we have um, these ecosystem processes or services, things that we measure, things that we care about in ecology. They could be anything from carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus cycling to 
grassland productivity to pollination services to um, hydrology. And these things interact with global change factors. So we have things that are changing. They're changing pretty rapidly. Climate is changing. Invasive species are moving around. We have changes in fire cycles across the West. All of these things are happening and influencing and interacting with the things that we measure when we go out in the field. And over and above all of that, we have this other kind of filter of what federal agencies and state agencies have decided to do and how we manage our land. This is really important, especially in the West, where 70% of our land is um, either federal or state land, right? So like any decision that a federal or a state manager makes has a pretty big impact. And so that's a filter that plays a big role over and above anything else, right? So you can work in a really beautiful, pristine reserve. And I work in one in Costa Rica, and it's surrounded by uh, um, banana and sugarcane and pineapple plantations. And so I work in this little island, and we, we try to like understand how tropical forests work in this tiny little island that's surrounded by pesticides and fungicides and um, a lot of disturbance. And so like... I think in the West, it's similar, but we don't think about it the same way because the islands are so much bigger. But I think the management part really matters. And so when I think about this, I think about, okay, all of these things are happening, and I'm really interested in understanding how carbon is cycling in these systems and how it's interacting with the availability of nitrogen for plant growth. And I'm you know, thinking about ants because I still love them, um, and they still do a lot for carbon. And I think about microbes, and I think about all of this, and it sometimes gets overwhelming because it's a lot, right? And I'm just one person. And so I started doing a series of different experiments to try to understand some of this. And so one of the things that I've been working on, and this is for my Moab days, but I'm still kind of involved in this today, is trying to measure the effects of climate change on tiny organisms like biocrust. Now, in the desert ecosystems like the ones we see in Moab, and how many of you have been to Moab? It's crazy beautiful. Um, we're lucky that we have a place like that to call home, some of us. Um, these biological soil crusts in the desert ecosystems, they play these really big roles. They're responsible for most of the carbon and nitrogen cycling in these ecosystems. They do most of the carbon fixation here. They are the ones that hold the soil together. They literally form a physical cap over the soil and, and hold the soil in place. When you step on those biological soil crusts and you break apart the little filaments that hold the soil particles together, and then a windstorm comes through, all that soil just blows away. And so these organisms, as tiny as they are, are really important. And they're um, already kind of living at the threshold of their thermo limits, some of them. And if we warm up the, these ecosystems, how are they going to respond? And so in this really long-term climate change experiment that's been running for more than 10 years now, We've been warming these crusts and the plants. The plots also have plants in them. And we've also been changing the precipitation regimes for these plants. And what we're finding is that with warming, they're doing okay with two degrees warming. And so if we actually are able to follow through on a lot of our COP21 promises that we as the world made, and we limit warming to two degrees, good news, the crusts are going to be fine as long as the precipitation regime does not change. Now, the problem is warming doesn't happen by itself. Precipitation patterns are also changing and becoming way less predictable. The thing that's happening in the Moab area and other places in the Four Corners region of the US is that rainfall is becoming more pulsy and less like big. So instead of having these big rainstorms that last a whole day or several days in a row, you get these short storms that just blow through. And this is the field site where we work, and you can see, well, for one thing, it's freaking beautiful. But also, the other thing you can see is you can see rain, like clouds come through, like you can see them kind of through, and they just move across, and you get a rainfall, and it's like five or ten minutes, and then done. So what happens to these crusts is they get wet enough, and they start photosynthesizing, which means they start putting all their photosynthetic machinery together. They start investing that carbon into building things, like enzymes. And then they think, I'm going to be wet for a while, and I'll get the photosynthesize, and I'll get some of the carbon back. But then they dry out because the rain was really short. And so they repeatedly, if you do this enough, they go into a carbon deficit. So even though they're photosynthetic organisms, they can't get enough carbon, and they die. So if climate change sort of plays out the way it's supposed to, which is that rainfall is going to become more pulsy, 
Um, it doesn't really matter that they can live in really warm environments. They're going to die anyway. So that's a piece of bad news. Um, uh, but working out in the West, and especially in Utah, I started kind of realizing that over and above just studying the small crusts that I studied, there were all these cows everywhere. And they were trampling the crusts, and they were also eating the plants. And I was really interested in understanding how the what the impacts of livestock grazing were in these ecosystems. And here is a map, and again, for the West, the this kind of brown, green color is uh, federal lands that are grazed for pa or pasture lands. And you can see, well, in Montana, it's about half the state. In Wyoming, it's more than half, and Colorado, it's a little less. But across the West in general, grazing is a really big part of what we do with our land. It's a really big management thing. And if we are going to task our federal agencies that are in charge of these lands to also think about carbon now, so now they're thinking about uh, grassland productivity and how many head of cattle they can graze, and, uh, and also how to like balance that with oil and gas development and energy extractive industries in the West. Now we're also asking them, okay, federal agencies like the BLM, now you also have to think about carbon storage because we now are thinking that soils and grasslands have a huge capacity to grab carbon and store it underground. So we're going to ask you to manage for that. Um, and they're like, well, we don't understand how the carbon cycle works. So that's a big ask, right? We have that, like, we are still working on management plans from the 50s and 70s. And so you're asking us to understand something about carbon. We don't really understand because we haven't studied it. And so um, I really wanted to work on that. And I started looking in some of the archives of the BLM outside of Moab, so like Blanding and Monticello and um, Mexican Hack. That's a place. And uh, they have these BLM uh, field offices that have these like literal paper records of all the different things that have been done on their land. And what happened in the 50s and 60s is they built a bunch of grazing exposures and wildlife exposures and put them out on the landscape. And then no one really checked back on them. And I was like, well, some of these have been here for like 60 years that have been excluding livestock and wildlife grazers. So wouldn't it be awesome for me to go back into those plots and collect plants and collect soil and see how removing livestock and wildlife grazing impacts carbon storage. And then I can make that data available to the managers as they think about and are tasked with managing for carbon. Well, here's some data, right? Like right now, we don't have any, and we'll hear some, and it's literally from your very plot. So I did that, and I spent a couple of years uh, driving around uh, mostly Utah and Colorado um, visiting. I think I visited like 40 different exposures and collected soils and measured plants. And then it took another year to analyze all the soil. And what I found was that um, the data were really all over the place. It was extremely variable. And the thing that it really depended on was how heavily the lands were being grazed. And one thing to note is that in this part of like southeastern Utah and southwestern Colorado, grazing is actually pretty diffuse. We move the cattle around a lot. And amazingly, the managers, I was surprised, do a really good job making sure that um, whether they meant to or not, they're keeping the carbon pretty well uh, stuffed, I guess I would say. So um, what I found mostly was in places where the grazing was really intense, carbon uh, storage and soils was pretty low, and that's because the bio plant biomass was really decimated. And in places where they moved the cattle around a lot, there were no differences inside and outside of livestock exposures. <clears throat> Um, and so that's really cool. That's data that we can give back to the man management agencies and they can start making decisions, not just based on a gut feeling, but actually on some um, real science. Okay, so um, I've been working in Utah and Colorado, but thinking about ants a lot still. And um, then I had an opportunity to participate in this class. It was like an embedded, embedded sensor networks workshop or something in Costa Rica. Went down there with a bunch of other scientists to learn how to build sensor networks and put them out in the forest and measure all the different things that the forest does. And as we were walking around and thinking about um, <clears throat> the forest, tropical forest, I kept looking down at my feet and looking at the ants. So I guess I hadn't shaken my ant situation yet. So um, as I was walking around, I was seeing a lot of leafcutter ants, which are just adorable and super charismatic, and it was really easy to get excited about them. And then I would stumble upon these really ginormous nests, right? 
And I see all of these ants carrying these really fresh cut leaves into these nests where they cultivate a fungal symbiont that helps break down the leaves and grows hyphal fungi, um, hyphae that the ants feed upon. So first of all, this is a really cool example of a very ancient form of farming. But it's also this thing where they're bringing in really fresh, delicious carbon into these giant nests where there are millions and millions and millions of ants and lots of chambers with this fungi that's breaking down this fresh carbon and probably releasing lots of CO2, right? And so I started thinking about this as a system where the nests are basically these understory chimneys that are just spewing carbon into the understory of the forest. And no one had really ever measured that before. We have been fascinated by leafcutter ants for a really long time, but we hadn't really spent any time measuring the biogeochemistry of the nest. So I, along with a couple of other people, wrote an NSF grant. Um, and what we really wanted to do was figure out how leafcutter ants influence soil physical properties. So what they're doing when they build their nest is they're continuously moving soils up and down, right? It rains. All of their tunnels and stuff get buried and flooded, and then immediately you see them excavating the nest again, and all this fresh soil is getting brought back up to the top. So they're like a conveyor belt of soil, right? They're moving in like this. And so they're changing the soil profiles. They're Because the way they carry the soil is like they grab it with their mandibles, they make a little ball like this. And so when you look close up to the nest, you see these balls of soil. That's really different than what soil usually looks like. So they're changing like very basic soil properties just by being themselves. Um, and they're also, you know, there are lots of, because now these soils are really airy, lots of roots grow in. So plants preferentially grow their roots into nests. And then you have these hot spots where there's lots of kind of cycling of carbon and also nitrogen and phosphorus. And so the roots will grab that stuff. So they're kind of hot spots of biogeochemistry. And if we take all of these things together, what the ants directly influence by just being themselves, and we measure the carbon dioxide efflux, and now we've also been measuring methane, and we also measure um, the soil water that comes out of these nests with isometers. Um, uh, we can figure out something that's akin to their carbon footprint, right? And if we take their carbon footprint and we multiply by nest size or nest density in a forest, we get their ecosystem impact. It's a pretty crude but pretty effective way to measure their footprint their ecological footprint. And so we've been doing this, and NSF gave us money. I gladly took the money and spent the first, in the first year, maybe seven months in the field, setting everything up and doing a bunch of like biogeochemical analyses, measuring soil enzymes, and all kinds of stuff. And at the same time, we've been working with modelers, and we've been building other instruments to measure other things in the, in the nest. It's like a really cool playground for testing all kinds of ideas about how ecosystem engineers affect um, these very basic uh, ecological processes, like how carbon moves around, right? So it's been really fun. We're wrapping it up. Um, and we have some preliminary results, but I'm not going to show you graphs today. I'm just going to leave you with this. Uh, leaf cutter ants are really cool, but when you set up a three-year experiment, <coughs> and you put a lot of sensors into the ground and you sink thousands and thousands of dollars literally into soils um, with the hopes that you're going to measure things, the ants will move. They will leave the nests that you have just spent thousands of dollars instrumenting and go somewhere else. That happens. So um, the lesson that I learned from this experiment is how to make lemonade out of lemons and how to study legacy effects. <laughs> um, and that's what I've been doing. So uh, more than half of our nests have been uh, abandoned <laughs> in the process of doing this experiment. So we are getting a really amazing opportunity to study legacy effects. Guess what? No one has ever studied that. So, yeah. Um, and if it wasn't enough to do those three projects, I also decided that it was a waste of my time to not study my very own backyard. And though I was spending a lot of time in Costa Rica running around chasing these ridiculous ants, um, I was missing some opportunities to be involved in research in my very campus. And so University of Wyoming um, got a really big EPSCOR grant. Like you, they're also an EPSCOR school. And they got a grant to set up a big observatory to really understand mountain hydrology and how snow dynamics um, and interactions between like 
topography, slope, um, vegetation dynamics, uh, soil properties, how they all influence hydrology, and ultimately stream flows for down the streams. And what I was really interested in was understanding how land development interacted with climate change to influence snow hydrology, because outside of these mountains, outside of Laramie, Wyoming, the snowy range, there's a lot of oil and gas development, right? And that's kind of new, that's been like in the last five to 10 years. And a lot of that oil and gas development is destructive. And a lot of the particulates from the, that development, including from soil disturbance, get blown upslope into the mountains and then land on the snow in the form of what we would call dust. And then that dust warms up when it's sunny, melts the snow earlier than we would expect, and changes the snow hydrology pretty significantly. And that's something that the Waikik project hadn't been measuring to date. So that was my addition to um, sort of the big collaborative group was thinking about, well, what about dust? If we have all this oil and gas development dust landing, is it going to change the ultimate hydrology of the system? And it's been really fun. I had to learn how to um, snowmobile for field work. Um, that didn't go super well. And so um, I've decided that it's better for me to take five times as long and just skin and be human powered because I crashed the snowmobile like in the first five minutes of <laughs> getting it out of the gate. So um, it's been really fun though. I've learned a lot about snow hydrology, something I didn't do before. It does feel like a third PhD. I've been learning a lot about snow isotopes um, and asking job questions when I don't understand something. But I guess the point here is that um, the great thing about being a scientist is that you can always ask a new question. And because the thing that we really learn when we get a PhD is how to do how to like do research, not necessarily the topic that you're studying. You might think that you know the topic you're studying, but what you're really learning is how to persevere when new questions arise. And so I just kind of went after it and asked new questions. And so uh, ecology has been this fantastic framework for addressing difficult questions. It's super integrative, it's super interdisciplinary. I love that you get to work with all kinds of people and field work is really fun. I can't discount the fun part, it's really fun. But I feel like the thing that has been lacking for me through all of this and throughout my career in the last 10 years was really understanding how I can take the science that I do and apply it in a way that's meaningful beyond my own fun factor. So fun, yes, fieldwork will always be fun. But at some point, I really wanted to make sure the science I was doing had an impact beyond myself. So this is just a quote that I like. We can judge our progress by the courage of our questions and the depths of our answers, our willingness to embrace what is true rather than what feels good. And for me, doing ecology felt really good, but it didn't feel fulfilling in a bigger sense. And also I kept seeing these cold trains as I was driving up and down from Colorado to Wyoming and somehow just couldn't escape the fact that they probably were meaningful too. And so um, I started asking myself that question that maybe some of you have asked yourself already, and if you haven't, you might in the near future, which is that how do I put the knowledge and the experience I have doing science to work? Um, and to address climate change, which is what I've been thinking about a lot, I felt like I had to really face the ugly problems that were the cause of climate change. And that's mostly the fossil fuel economy. And so uh, from ecology, I went to fossil fuels. I applied and was accepted into the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. Um, AAAS is the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, it's an incredible fellowship opportunity for folks that have a PhD to go work in government for one to two years. And in the process, they lend their scientific expertise to the government and sort of are the voice of science in the room. And at the same time, they we learn how the government works, which is not at all what I would have expected. And so it's been a really valuable experience. I've been in um, as a fellow for the year for a year and a half. I have six months to go. And uh, I work at the Department of Energy in the Office of Fossil Energy. I interviewed in a lot of different places and I kept really pushing the Office of Fossil Energy to take me. And they were like, hmm, no, you are not like you're not an engineer. You're not like a chemist, a chemist, you like don't, you're an ecologist, and it seems like you're a hippie one at that, like you live in Boulder. Yeah, I, you seem really liberal. 
Um, it just that nah, doesn't feel like a good fit. And I was like, no, 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 like give me a chance. I am really excited to come here. I think that an ecology perspective could be really cool because I'm really excited to learn, but I also think like a systems thinker could be really good here. And they're like, ah, oh, okay, uh, you can come, but like we're not promising we're gonna keep you. And I was like, yes. So <laughs> I got in and I started working on decarbonization of the fossil fuel, uh, basically economy. And I came in with some really strong preconceived notions. For example, and this is something you'll hear people in Boulder say a lot. Uh, well, I drive a I drive a, like an electric car or a hybrid, and like I have solar panels on my house. So if I'm off the grid, and like I'm doing my part, um, and why can't we just power everything with wind and solar? I probably said those very same words also, because the fundamental truth is most of us don't understand where our power comes from. Um, and so I got to the Department of Energy and I said some really asinine things and they were like, I mean, we were right about you, you are crazy, um, but I learned really quick. And I got really passionate about the need for us to decarbonize. Um, once I understood how much of our electricity and power comes from fossil fuels, especially in the West, it was like, okay, if we're going to hit those climate targets, which I think we have to, if we don't, the consequences are dire, we have to decarbonize these things that run our world. Like, this is made out of petroleum, right? Like, we drove today to campus in a car. That's run by oil. Um, the lights are on because of coal. So all of these things, if we don't decarbonize them, then we don't have any chance to hit even a two-degree target. Like, we, that's not going to happen. And so what we've been working a lot on is bringing together science, understanding how carbon capture works. So if we're going to decarbonize power plants, we have to put a carbon capture unit on the plant at the smokestack, basically, grab that carbon and do something with it. If we don't do that, we don't do anything. Like, we can put as many windmills as you want everywhere and solar panels, and we still don't solve the problem. And even if we get rid of all coal plants, we have natural gas plants. And even if we get rid of all natural gas plants, we have to make windmills out of something, probably steel and cement. To make those things, we still burn fossil fuels. So this is a big thing. And I got really excited about the opportunity to use science and policy to try to make this, like, to push this forward. And so there's a lot of really cool science around carbon capture, um, the actual process of capturing carbon molecules from um, affluent that has like carbon, sulfur, all kinds of things in it, um, and compressing it. Like that's really cool science. You can do solvents, you can do membranes. There's a lot of really awesome research in that area. And for the last year and a half, I've had a chance to go all over the US, go to national labs, go to universities, and check out some of the very cool research that's happening in carbon capture. I am so impressed. I had no idea. The other really cool area of science is carbon storage. And that's all about geology and the subsurface and engineering. And so I've learned a lot about that. So we have these two big like science questions. How do we capture carbon? And how do we store carbon safely? And that's, those are science problems at the core. But then we also have this like soft side of policy and public's perception of safety, right? So that's, those aren't science questions as much as they are just like, how do we deal with humans and our fears and our politics and our, our like um, ideological gaps and our mistrust of each other and of science? And that's been really interesting. And so what I've learned about policy to date is that it's really a matter of translating the science and being a scientist in a room that can say, that thing that you just said, that's not a thing. That's like scientifically not a thing. But this other, like this other way of doing it is scientifically sound. So let's do it this way. Just being a scientist in the room that can translate science for public consumption. And then building relationships. It's all about your ability to listen to other people, understand where they're at, and instead of like, raining science down on them and being like, well, actually, like, you're super wrong, um, but more like listening to, listening to people, right? Like it's all about listening and understanding and not patronizing and not pandering, but just saying like, I hear where you're coming from. You're a coal miner and you work in a coal plant and like your livelihood depends on this. So me telling you all this science stuff, it just doesn't matter. Like that's not what your reality is. But I can listen to you and hear what you're saying, and we can find common ground. Because in the end, you care about your kids going to a good school and getting a good education. 
and you care about like, having food on the table for your family, and I care about those things too. We actually care about the same stuff. So let's talk about that first. Let's not like let's not talk about abortion first. Let's talk about the things that we have in common, right? And then we can figure out the, the other stuff later. So it's translating science, it's building relationships, and it's really economics. If I learn anything being in government and working on these climate change mitigation issues, is that at the core of everything is economics. So what I really wish I'd had is a degree in economics, <laughs> because then I could really uh, try to understand and push policies forward that can make economic sense. So no company is going to invest a million dollars into carbon capture if it doesn't work out for them economically or if they're not forced to by regulations. Currently, the very current state we're in, there are no regulations forcing them, and there's no economic, um, there's no economic incentive. So they're not going to do it. Can we come up with uses for carbon? Can we come up with ways to use CO2 and make something and sell it? If we can do that, we can actually hit our climate targets. So that's like a really big thing. And so um, as head of the Department of Energy, well, I moved to Washington and I didn't really love it. So I kind of sold my bosses on this idea that I should work a lot in the West because I come from the West. I've worked a lot in Colorado and Wyoming and Montana and Utah, and it would just be really beneficial for the Department of Energy to keep sending me back to work on this stuff. And they were like, yeah, okay. Um, they, they've given me a lot of leeway. So I've been really thinking about the energy landscape of the West. And this is just a graphic. This, is, this was published in Western Confluence today. Western Confluence is a magazine published at the University of Wyoming. <coughs> and it's basically showing how much of the energy in each state is produced by coal and how much um, how much coal and other resources the states produce. So in Montana, you guys produce a lot of coal and you use a lot of coal, but your population is like two people. <laughs> <laughs> All of you are in this room right now. Um, Wyoming, one person. I, and I'm here. Who is in Wyoming right now? Crap, no one. So um, it's, it's just like a really interesting landscape because like California, full of people, <coughs> most of the energy comes from natural gas, more than 50%, and the other 50% is mostly renewable. There's really no coal, and whatever little coal there is, um, is basically being phased out in the next 10 or 15 years. Yeah. Um, and so this is kind of the landscape for the West and the resources that we have and the resources that we use. And it's interesting because for each state, you want to think about how to incentivize the states to use and produce less coal and maybe replace coal with natural gas. So like that's the lesser evil. That means fracking. Fracking is fraught with controversy. Um, but also, can we incentivize coal plants and natural gas plants to start integrating renewable energy now so that we can transition more quickly? So, the big thing I've been working on for the last few months at the Department of Energy is thinking about how fossil fuel generation, fossil fuel plants, or industrial facilities can be integrated with renewable energy like wind and solar. Are there processes at the plants that we can replace with energy from windmills? And if we can, that means we're going to decarbonize today. Like, if there are processes that the plants carry out on a daily basis that right now they're using coal to do, if we can plug in, in some magical way, renewable energy to run those processes, that's an immediate reduction in emissions, right? So it's like, yes, I want to see a world where we don't use any fossil fuels, and then whatever we use, we immediately capture the CO2 and put it underground. But in the meantime, we have to transition, and we have to do it today. Like, every molecule of CO2 that goes in the atmosphere is, a, is one more molecule that should have been there. <laughs> so what can we do today? Um, especially in places like the West where we have such great renewable resources and where really the things are, the, the gaps that we face sometimes are transmission. For Montana, you, you're not connected very well with Montana, um, so do better. But also there's the ideological gaps, right? So like we hate, we hate renewable energy because we love coal. Well, it's like we don't have to love one and hate the other. They can work together. And so what are the technical challenges to overcome here? Can we make these technologies talk to each other? That's a cool engineering and science question, right? Let's do that. And then can we make the people talk to each other? Can a coal miner and a person who works on a wind farm talk to each other? Well, probably, but maybe again, don't start with a portion. Start with something else. 
Um, and can the scientists that work on fossil fuels talk to the scientists that work on renewables? Well, actually, that's a challenge too. So we have to like start bridging those gaps across all levels. And that's what I've been working on. And so um, as I've been doing all of this, I've kind of come to this place where I realized the communication part is really our biggest problem. That the technological challenges we face, we can overcome because we're smart and we're innovative. But that the problems that we face are really this like science communication problems. And so I've been working on, um, I've been working with a couple of filmmakers on making films about science and about scientists and about climate change. And we made a film called The End of Snow. Um, it premiered last fall at the Boulder Adventure Film Festival, and it's been playing all over our film festivals across the US. It played in Bozeman in December. Did anyone go see it? No? Guys. <laughs> okay. Well, um, we took one of the chapters from the film and released it as its own short film, and it's gotten a lot of press um, and a lot of, uh, really, a lot of love. So I'm going to show you, it's just five minutes long, I'm going to show you that film, and then um, I'll wrap it up. Have you ever wondered if you watched the snow long enough, what stories it might tell? There is someone who has done it. His name is Billy Barr. I spell it small b-i-l-l-y, small b-a-r-r. -R. Some people call him the snow guardian. He lives in a cabin out in the woods. Picture this. It's a snowy day, it's dark and cold, and you make a fire and you're sitting by the fire and you're reading with a cup of tea, and it goes on for nine months. Billy lives alone in this house he helped build. Here he grows his garden, has an impressive hat collection, loves cricket, and dreams of Bollywood. Every couple of weeks, he skis back into the nearest town for supplies. He's been doing this for more than 40 winters. But Billy does a little more than just read and drink tea. For those 40 winters, Billy has kept a meticulous record of snow in his little part of the world. Okay, the market said February 26, 1978, 10 and a half inches of snow that day. It's January 20th, minus 11 and a half. April 28th, 1980, high was 41. Ooh, that sounds nice. 1997, one half inch new snow. A weasel was roaming around inside the shack. Damn, the birds were back. I lived in an eight by 10 foot old shack. I had no electricity, no water, and I had nothing. I mean, I was just there all day. The main thing I interacted with was the weather and the animals. So I started recording things just because it was something to do. I had nothing to prove, no goals, no anything. So actually a researcher at the lab wanted to look at it. And then once he started looking at it scientifically, then all of a sudden like these decades worth of data were being used for more than my own curiosity. Billy has done this every day, twice a day, all winter long. I'd keep going until the snow was gone. And if it snowed, I would record that no matter when. The trend I see is that we're getting a permanent snowpack later and we get to bare ground sooner we'll have years where there was a lot of snow on the ground, and then we lost snow sooner than years that had a lot less snow just because it's a lot warmer now. In a normal winter, you'd expect to have four to five record high temperatures. Last year, Billy recorded 36. Not only is it a lot warmer, we're getting a lot of dust blowing in. As Soon as you get dust on the snow, it melts like that. You're talking about the, the, the snowpack, the water su supply for most of the Southwest. 
I'm not real hopeful just because I don't know how you reverse something like that. As we leave Colorado behind, Billy imparts one last bit of advice. Uh, it, it's like anything else. You know, I, I learned to ski to get around. I learned how to ski better so I wouldn't fall down all the time. Over a period of time, I kind of learned how to survive in this environment. Actually, learning to fall is probably the most important thing. If you're gonna fall, sit. A lot easier falling on your butt than on your face. posted the short film and into a competition called Film for Climate, which is a global competition, and it came in second place, um, which is incredible. And then it's gotten a lot, a lot, a lot of coverage. So um, it's been in the Atlantic and National Geographic and Slate. It was highlighted as the National, Gra National Geographic like film of the week or whatever. It was on the front page. It was an outside magazine. It was, um, he, it's been covered on the radio. It's just, it's been everywhere. And the crazy thing about that is like, Billy is an incredibly compelling character. Um, and it's really sort of like easy to love him, but in hearing his story, you also are learning something about climate change. Um, and he has some really, you know, dire things to say. He doesn't think that there's any way to reverse what's happening. Um, so I think, through using a character that people can really relate to, that is really endearing and lovely, we are also able to get a message out and maybe reach people that we wouldn't have otherwise reach, right? So for me, to premiere a film at the Boulder Adventure Film Festival was full of Boulder people in the audience, and I, afterwards, like, when they called me up to the stage to talk about it, and I was like, well, this film wasn't made for you. You guys are not my <laughs> audience because you're already, like, you already care about climate change to some extent. So I really want to get to the people that haven't seen this before. And having Billy be a character and having The End of Snow be a film that people really like, it's playing all over, it's playing in small rural communities. People really like it. So I think it's this other vehicle. There's science in it, but it's really about like the heart connection. I think that it's ultimately going to maybe be more impactful than any of the science I've ever done. So, um, and just moving forward in terms of impact, so the science communication part has been really impactful. The other thing that's kind of blown up is um, immediately following the election last November, uh, me and three other women scientists friends, we were texting. We had this long text string that's going back years and years, right? It's oftentimes full of pictures of puppies and babies and what we're doing and making fun plans for trips that we're going to do together, stupid like burpee challenges that I always fail at. Uh, and, and then after the election, it just, it turned and it was full of desperation and worry. And what are we going to do? And what about our friends who are uh, marginalized people? And what about science? And what about women? And very quickly, within a day of that text string, it went from a text message to an email thread. And we started adding other women scientists into the thread. And it went from five people to 10 to 20 to 100 within two days. <coughs> and to 200 within three days. And we decided that we clearly, what, what we were saying was resonating and that we needed to write an open letter, kind of voicing our concerns and reaffirming our commitment to fight against these things. And we published an open letter. Um, and it was published to women science, in science from women in science. It wasn't um, targeting Trump or his administration. It wasn't targeting the Republicans. It was to women scientists. And what we basically said is science is foundational in a progressive society and that the anti-knowledge and anti-science sentiments that were expressed repeatedly during the US election threaten the very foundations of our society. And our work as scientists and our values as human beings are under attack. And because of these things, we reaffirm our commitment to stand up for science, 
Stand up for women and stand up for all other marginalized groups in science and in society. And though our letter was in response to our election, these things that we say, they're not just happening in the US. They're happening all across the world. And so we really need to build a network, a global network of scientists and specifically women scientists, supporting each other and standing up for the things that we value. So we published this letter and we were like, oh, I wonder if we could get 500 signatures. So we're gonna call ourselves 500 Women Scientists because our goal is 500 signatures. Well, uh, we published it on November 12th and within two days we had um, 500 signatures uh, because that was, I guess, not a good goal. And within, you know, another day it was 2,000. And of January 20th when we made this infographic, it was 13,246. Today, I checked this morning, there are 17,000 signatures of just this like open pledge. Um, and then the other really cool thing is it's not just in the US, signatures have come from all over the world. Now the US and Central and South America have a lot of signatures, um, other parts of the world less so, parts of Africa have none, but there are signatures from more than 100 countries all over the world, which is amazing, which means that the message that we kind of wrote down resonates not just with us. And we started these things we call local pods. So it's a chance for 500 women scientists to kind of pledge people um, and supporters to meet other women scientists in their communities. I checked this morning, we have more than 100 local pods. So what local pods are, are just a chance for women scientists to come together, talk about things that actually matter in their communities. So like in my community in Colorado, I think people care a lot about climate change and they care a lot about um, being politically active at our local levels and like pestering our senators, specifically one. Um, and so the, the pod is really targeting that, but other pods are doing very different things. So the DC pod is very active on the Hill and, and targeting Congress, but like the pod in Arizona really just cares a lot about climate change and they do all of their work is about climate change. Uh, and so these are like where the pods are. There is a pod in Bozeman. They're meeting tonight at five o'clock at Bridger Brew for their first meeting. Um, and so the pods are really great. We don't control what the pods do as long as they're, they like kind of match our mission and values, we're good. Um, and I just want to say that the, the organization 500 Women Scientists uh, was started by women who are earth science, earth science scientists, um, biogeochemistry, microbial ecology, ecosystem science. But um, though it started there, we are super interdisciplinary and there are women from all kinds of backgrounds coming together. I think this is really an amazing opportunity also to improve our science. I know that most of the things that I've learned that I've gotten really excited about have actually come from disciplines that aren't the disciplines that I work in. And so um, to, to wrap up, I think for you to put your science education to work, um, we have to recognize that science is foundational. It's really important that a PhD in science is a lesson in perseverance. You might become an expert in the tiny thing that you study, but really you're just showing that you can stick to something, get through the hard stuff and know how to learn and know how to like persevere. Um, I know that evidence-based policy needs science. I see it every day in my work. Oftentimes I'm the only scientist in the room and certainly the only woman. And if I wasn't in the room to speak up and say, this is what we know from the research, then no one would say it. And then the policies would be totally crazy. They still might be, but at least you, and if you're really, like, if you can, if you can say it in a way that doesn't make people feel like under attack, then you actually do better. Um, we, as scientists and science in general, we need to tell our story. Scientists are the most amazing, ridiculous, goofy, lovely people I know. I am super biased because I am one, but all of my scientist friends are amazing. And if I just, if, I, if the world could know about these amazing people, wouldn't it be awesome? Wouldn't we all love science more if we could love the scientists? Um, scientists are storytellers. We tell stories about science all the time. We just have to learn to tell stories in a way that other people can also care about. And scientists are activists. I know there's a debate right now about the role of activism in science and whether scientists should or should not be politically active or speak up. 
I fall strongly on the side of if we don't speak up for our science today, there will be no science tomorrow. And that science has always been political and scientists have always been activists. It's just that lately, in the last 30 years or so, we've been really squashed and we have to rise up. Especially today when science can solve so many of our world problems, but when there's so much skepticism about science and scientists. So we have to speak up. And so I'll just leave you with this quote. <laughs> The good thing about science is that it's true whether you believe in it or not. <laughs> so when it gets dark and hard and you're like, ah, oh, like I can't go to another protest and I can't, like I can't keep fighting and just feel like I'm beating my head against the wall with this paper or whatever. Just remember, science is true whether you believe in it or not. It's always there. It's like our touchstone. It's our foundation. We can always go back to it. Okay, thanks. Oh, do we have time for questions? I'll take a question or two. I'm curious, your map of the world participation in the 500 women scientists, Russia is like super uh, conspicuous up there. It's kind of an odd question. No, I'm just a, curious about it. It's a great question. So I am an immigrant from the USSR, I should have stated that. Um, so a lot of this feels like personal on every level to me. I'm a Jewish immigrant from the Soviet Union. Um, and I was like, well, maybe I can like translate the pledge into Russian with the help of my Republican parents. Um, and maybe like that will get some Russian friends. But they, my parents did not know anything. Like, obli like totally oblivious. Like I have been, like I've been. My name has been on like the Atlantic. Like it, I've been like in every major newspaper. I'm NPR. I'm BBC. My parents do not know. <laughs> they have no idea. I choose not to tell them because they voted for Trump. And I'm like, I don't want. I, for us to be able to have a conversation and speak still, we need to not talk about this. Um, I know, and I feel like there are reasons that are just horrible. And I personally like know what they are. They can't science. The, the like level, like the reason my family immigrated to the U.S. is like why they can't science. Yeah. Plus, I didn't want to translate it. It's really hard. <laughs> we have translated the pledge into like seven languages, including Farsi. There was an interesting article, I don't remember if it was in the Atlantic or, or where, and it was probably a couple years ago, but it, the headline was something like, scientists need to understand policy, it's not policymakers who need to understand science. And uh, it, they made a really compelling case that, you know, as scientists were always saying, like, they just need to understand the science, but the truth is policymakers are weighing lots of different things. And uh, so as a scientist, I still feel like, if you just understood, you know, if you had a systems approach, but I also appreciate that perspective, then at a certain point, I just feel like I should be able to do science. Yeah. And so what do you think is the role of scientists in sort of their responsibility and understanding all of the many uh, things that go into policy decisions versus just trying to communicate the importance of science? Yeah, so I think at some point, we just need to do our science, right? And wouldn't it be great if we lived in a world that where like that's all we needed to do, and then put it on someone else's shoulders to translate the science that we do for home? And so there are those jobs, and they're starting to become more important. So if you're a scientist who just like doesn't want to, or for whatever reason isn't interested in having a career in research science, the need for you as a person who understands science to work with policymakers is huge. Because policymakers, they are not going to learn science. They're not. They are like literally running around like chickens with their heads cut off, trying to like just not drown. And so having an advisor that works for a senator who understands science, who's maybe a former scientist, is critical, right? But like you as a scientist, what is your responsibility? I think your responsibility is to do the science that you do best. If you have the capacity and the interest, go spend a year on the Hill or in a government agency and learn how policy works, and then come back and see how much your science changes. It will. Mm -hmm. But I think there is a, there's like a special kind of career track for people who can take science and translate it. It doesn't have to be us. 
But I think saying something like, oh, they could just understand, that's, no, they're not going to. They're busy. They're okay. Sorry. But it's really fun to go do that for a year. Two years, maybe too long. <laughs> One year, great. There are so many museums and stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, a follow-up kind of to that is, um, what about this interface then with education, and particularly of kids, you know, mm -hmm. elementary through K through 12, K to 12 education? Because to me, that that seems to be where we're totally regressing over the last, well, it's actually over the last decade or so, <laughs> 50, even despite the STEM efforts and stuff. Yeah, there seems to be this thing of, well, science is for scientists, and I'll either believe it or not, and me, per I personally don't have to have any foundation. You say it's foundational on yeah. it, and and that's the that's the way local school boards are acting and stuff. So yeah. Oh man, I have strong opinions about that, which are that scientists need to run for office, and local school boards would be a great place right. to yeah. have scientists weigh in. Um, and the other thing is that there is lots of evidence to show that. Um, a lot of like the fear of science and math happens really early on. So it's like really important for early ed early age educators to have the best sort of tools and making science super fun. And like the cool, it has to be like the cool right. thing, right? right? Right, I just a quick follow. I mean, but part of it too is, I mean, we've done it to ourselves in some sense because there's always this competitive aspect. But we're gonna take a, we're going to take Bozeman High School, and we're going to find the very best, brightest kids and turn them into scientists, as opposed to saying we're going to educate ninety percent of the kids to understand science. Yeah. And so that's a personal thing for me. It really bothers me that yeah. that, and I don't know if you have any insight into how to impact that. I guess except for running for school board. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is to go into so okay. If you're an academic, you are teaching classes, writing grants, writing papers, running a research program, uh, maybe exercising and eating right, probably not. Mm -hmm. If you have a family, then you're running around and like taking care of your kids. And the things that you're actually, like the merits that of your work are your publications and your grants, not so much your teaching. Um, so if you go, are gonna go into local schools and spend your valuable time that isn't given, you get no credit for that. But like, we also as scientists, like we have a higher calling, some of us, that we think this is important. And so maybe like the thing that we need to do is go into local schools and like talk about how science is awesome. But it's so hard to ask people to do that. It's hard, like scientists are being asked to be like amazing science communicators now, right? And it's like, okay, let me add that to my list of the things that I'm supposed to do. So I don't have a good solution, except to say like, I was not an awesome student. I was a super slacker and somehow I became a scientist. So saying only the brightest and best are gonna be scientists is just dumb. Yeah. I think you made a great point about saying that uh, science communication could, should, and is starting to be maybe, hopefully, a, a crack on its own. Mm -hmm. um, but man, we should, we should do our best not to judge those people, because the other thing that happens is the judgment, right? Like if you're not, Pursuing a career in like tenure track academia and you're doing something else with science, you sort of fear that you're going to get judged and seen as lesser and not as good of a scientist. And it's like just the judgment at every level needs to stop. You need to start embracing people for the choices that they make because, like, if science is a mountain, there are lots of different ways to come at it, right? You can come at it from here, or from here, or from here. It's just like religion, we're all like believe in the same thing. We just approach it different ways. <sighs> Which is why diversity is so important because that's what brings those different uh, approaches up your mountain. Yeah. So. I mean, I like the gondola approach. I want, I don't want to hike up the mountain. I want to take a gondola. But Jaw is going to hike up that mountain. Like, we have a different approach. We're going to get to the top, and now I'm going to be less tired. <laughs> 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 not the snowmobile, the gondola. We, we, the snowmobiles are now not. I'm not allowed to touch the first time the snowmobiles. Peace, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.